Today, my conversation is with the amazing J.P. Pagluda. He's the lead pastor of Harris Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, and he formerly led the porch at Watermark Community Church in Dallas, Texas, a young adult gathering of more than 3,500 young people. He's also the author of Welcome to Adulting, Navigating Faith, Friendship, Finances, and the Future, which I ironically thought was he was talking to me. And today we're talking about his passion to reach people in their 20s and 30s with the grace and love of Jesus. He shares his story of addiction and recovery to pornography, sex, and drugs. And it's just inspiring and courageous. He also talks about equipping young people for adult life and helping them avoid common pitfalls that could derail their success. This honest and really authentic conversation was so moving, so inspiring that I know you and your kids and grandkids and your friends are truly going to enjoy. So let's listen to JP Pakluda. All right, JP, welcome to See, Here Love, and welcome to Canada. Yeah, let's go. Where are you at right now? Where are you living? I'm in Waco, Texas. We moved here a year ago from Dallas, and so had been in Dallas for 20 years, and then moved an hour and a half south to Waco, Texas. Okay, so you're near like Magnolia? With oh, yeah. Chip's and in the other room, actually. <laughs> um, well, yeah, Matt, yeah. we'll do another group interview or something, like a small group after yeah. that. Yeah, Chip, you come in in a minute, okay? <laughs> That's awesome. JP, how are you doing with your family during COVID-19? Yeah, I would say generally we're doing very well. And so I've been trying to reinvent this 2,000-year-old tradition called church. My wife loves to stay at home. Her and Joanna have that in common, Joanna Gaines. Uh, she is a homebody through and through. And so this is kind of her just, she's like, hey, I, I hope this never stops. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I, I can't go and do enough. And so I miss the beach and the mountains and everything in between. And, uh, and so with that said, I would say we're, we're doing okay. Like, uh, the, the hardest part is probably just that compromising in our marriage, but, uh, the kids are doing well with homeschool. Our, our staff has rallied well. And so we're thriving. You look good. Like it's your beard trimmed up. Yeah. Yeah, the, awesome. yeah. The COVID, the COVID beard a little <laughs> bit for sure. I know my poor husband, his hair, his beard, he's had to trim it and he's like missing his barber. I think more than anybody, his barber. Yeah. I'm missing my, uh, if I can be so honest, like my spa and my, my uh, nail technician. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I woke up this morning. I was like, you know what I need as a massage? I know that's so oh. first world, but I'm just like, I'd love to go get a massage today. And that probably is not a thing right now. Well, I'm glad that you're here with us because I'm really excited about this new book that you've written. Yeah. Uh, Welcome to Adulting. I love it. And it's like navigating faith, friendship, finance, and future, which I was going to make a joke like, you love the F words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots of F words. <laughs> but, you know, and I think even as a Gen Xer, this is a book that some days I'm like, I need to adult some days. Uh, but what's your story behind this, JP? Because you don't write a book like this without yeah. a story behind it. And obviously you have great impact with millennials. So yeah. what's your background up to this book? He has two stories. One is mine, and then, and then one is really a story God let me live after um, I, I came to know him. So I was raised in the church, uh, went to church twice a week, church school for 18 years, and w was really rebellious there. Uh, you know, that looked like just gr getting into relationships at an early age, drugs at an early age, alcohol, all of that. And I went to college and really crammed four years of partying into two years. I kind of always said my prayers, but never really had a relationship with God. Uh, moved to the big city after college and, you know, wanted to be a millionaire before I was 30. Had the penthouse condo, the Jaguar S-type, the job, the corporate world, all of that, and continued to live that club life. And 18 years ago, or 19 years ago now, I was at a club one Saturday night. I met someone that I, or I was kind of reacquainted with someone that I knew from college. And I just said, what are you doing this weekend? And she said, I'm going to go check out this church. I said, great, pick me up. And I, I went and, and she really exits the story, but I just kept going and I would, I would be hung over and I'd smell like smoke from the night before from partying. And I just sit in the back and I would really think, all right, what do I believe about God? 
And I came to a, a saving faith in Jesus Christ, Christ, just trusting in his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. And so I looked at my life and it was really like the world would say I had it all together, but honestly, it was just a complete mess. I was addicted to pornography. I had sexual addiction, uh, was materialistic and, and just really wasn't doing anything to make the world a better place. I was so, I was narcissistic ultimately. And the Holy Spirit began to work on that. And so that leads to kind of the second story, which is five years later, I would tell you I was formally called in a vocational ministry. And that's the story in and of itself that the Lord said, hey, you're going to come work for me. And I had such a heart for people in their 20s and 30s because that's where my life changed. And there was this ministry that I became a part of called The Porch. And it was about 150 people that would meet on a Tuesday night. But uh, as, as I got to continue to invest there, it grew to about 3,500 people and then ultimately 18 other campuses. So 3,500 people in one place and then 18 other campuses. And, um, and so then I had this front row seat for tens of thousands of young adults, people in their 20s and 30s. And I got to see just the way that they're, you know, the decisions that they'd make that lead to life and the decisions that they'd make that lead to disaster. And I just began to write down those patterns and because it's so much of ministry is just pattern recognition. And so as I wrote down those patterns, Welcome to Adulting was born. And the goal behind that was I want to write a book that would truly and sincerely be helpful and address the issues of today for anyone in their 20s and 30s, uh, you know, coming out of college and entering into the real world. And so that's, that's the story behind it. You know, it's, I was sort of like nodding and smiling because I grew up as a missionary kid. And yet the whole, you know, my teen years into my early 20s, the prodigal years, and I was a clever, house music was my thing, yeah. drinking, drugs, smoking, everything, sexy clothing. And it was interesting. It's always the club. Like I always share the story, GP, when I go and speak at women's conferences, I literally heard one day, God speak to me twice. One was a drunk girl saying, you're a hypocrite out yeah. of nowhere while we're dancing. And it, it sort of like connected with me. You're a hypocrite, Melinda. You know who you are. You're a hypocrite. You're doing this. And the second was I was supposed to go into this like really shady room and I heard God and he did sound like Morgan Freeman or something like that say, don't go in. Yeah. Like, God will speak to you. And it really turned my life around just these moments in the club where God was like, I'm not going to lose you and just use these incredible things. It turned out, it's a longer story, JP, but it's really interesting that really in my 20s, even though I knew God from when I was really little, that was a turning point for me. So I love that. I love that you have a heart uh, for that age group. So I think there's many, many, many 20s and 30s that at that time and age frame, that's where they're sort of like getting it with God. Yeah, I think God's after them. And that you, you, <laughs> you're to make me tell the little story there in the middle of the pause. And so I was at my, my desk at my corporate job, I worked for a Fortune 12 company. And and I was studying the scriptures and now I was like falling in love with Jesus. And I was in a small group and committed to a church, a member there. And I was just, you know, doing all this. And I heard the Lord say, you're going to come work for me. And I was like, what was that? Kind of like Morgan Freeman, like you said. And I, I closed my laptop and put it in my, in my briefcase. And I walk out at 1 30 in the afternoon. And I'm just like, I think the Lord just called me to vocational ministry. I'll raise money. I didn't go to seminary. I'll raise money and I'll give it away. I don't know. I'll help the church. And, uh, and five days later, the church called and said, Hey, we have this job we want you to consider. And I was like, wait, like, who did you talk to? And they were like, nobody. We were just praying over this job description and you kept coming to your name. And I was just like, this is great. Like, come on, you know, are you sure? And they were like, yeah. And so the rest is history. It's amazing where people are like, does God speak? I'm like, like all the time. Yeah. Listen and people need to respond is what I always say. Like a lot of times answers to prayer are actually people responding to it and they just don't or yeah. not listening and think it's something else. So yeah. amazing. Okay, JP, in this book, which I love adulting, I always like say that to, you know, I have teenage stepkids. Yeah. And I say that into my friends and my, I think my mom even says it to me, even though I'm like a Gen X, I'm like, mom, I'm an adult, I'm in a family. But um, we just joke about it, so I love it. But there's a couple of points that I want to get through that you can kind of tease us with sort of like high-level answers. Yeah. In this book, you talk about this. So number one is seeking freedom can be a trap. And I think that's fascinating because it's always about our freedoms, freedom to live, freedom to love. And you actually say it can be a trap mm -hmm. for us. And it's not just for millennials, but I think for all of us. Yeah, often it is. And so this is easy to illustrate with my own life. And so I want, you know, I was raised in a small town in a farm in the middle of nowhere. 
and uh, you know wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it and so found sex at an early age you know just after adolescence and uh, and then got into pornography and so I want the freedom to look at porn right and so I go and I get an internet account and I can look at porn whenever I want and all of a sudden I can't not look at porn okay now so I've done drugs I've done cocaine I've done ecstasy and I smoked weed every day for a season of my life <laughs> but but nothing has gripped my soul quite like that. And I, and I couldn't stop it. You know, I, I, and, and then it was just like, I could even tell, even as a non-Christian, I'm like, man, there's something unhealthy about this because it's gripped me. I, I like all of a sudden I'm daydreaming about this and, and, and life is less interesting and all of the bright colors have kind of faded to gray. And, and if, if something's really vibrant, but it's not porn to me, it's just really not porn. And so this would be a great example of, of the slavery that, that I'm talking about. Another one would be, uh, you know, like heroin, which I've never done heroin, but you can see, or meth, you can see like even in mugshots of people that they go in and at first they're full of life and they have a sparkle in their eye and the next they're just a little bit faded and a little bit faded. And there's been these multiple arrests online where you can see these mugshots of just a human being decaying because they've given themselves to something else that owns them. And then I would just say, also, Melinda, sometimes in our pursuit of freedom, we want freedom from integrity, meaning that we, we don't want to be held responsible for our actions. And, and so that, that can be the worst kind of pursuit of freedom. And then lastly, I just say, sometimes you meet somebody and, and I, this is, I don't mean this to be a stu- like an overgeneralization, but it, it, it does happen, not always, but it does happen where you meet someone and they're, they're on the street ultimately because they want the freedom from any kind of authority in their life they want to be able to do what they want to do and so they've embraced the ultimate freedom which for them is homelessness and again that's not all homeless people but i've had those conversations with folks where it's it's a choice through their own pursuit of freedom wow that's interesting that really is gp like this freedom or like we want freedom to do what we want and and to do what makes us feel good but in the end it actually can be to the detriment of yourself it actually traps you. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. I, these are really good kind of like shockers that you're doing because I think people need to have the honest truth about these decisions. All right. Second question. Okay. This one, JP, follow your passion is not good advice. Okay. Now outing a lot of sort of like women and the way we talk, it's like, you know, you know, do what you, you love and that you're passionate about. If you're passionate about it, pursue it. I mean, that's been the language in society in culture. Christian or not, in the church or not, that is kind of the language. And you're saying, JP, it's not good advice. I think it's going to shock a lot of people who are going to be watching this and listening. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, again, I just would, would appeal to logic, you know, because follow your passion is a very emotionally charged statement. And, and I'm a passionate guy. Like anybody who knows me knows I'm, I'm an artist. I'm passionate. I'm full of feelings. I'm a feeler. I emote. And, and I can just look in the rearview mirror and see that my passions have led me to a lot of dead-end relationships, some, some waste-of-time jobs, that my hobbies have changed, my desires have changed. The problem with the, with the message of follow your passions is your passions are always changing. And then what happens is, is you, you lead yourself in and out of commitments in your life. You're left with a life that's a big sloppy mess. It's kind of like a painting that I started once where at first it was like a, a man in a boat and then it was a tree by a lake and then it was was kind of a Van Gogh-ish starry night. It kept changing. And as I added more colors and layers, it just ended up with this sloppy mess. And so at some point we have to add commitments to our passion. You know, like Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. And if you, if you just follow your passions, I promise you the thing that you're most passionate about at some point and someday you will no longer be passionate about it. It's like marriage too. Like you can jump into a marriage and, and you know, at some point you're not going to want to be married. And so if you just follow your passions, you'll follow your passions out of a marriage and into a marriage and out of a marriage, just like the way we date today. Uh, the the generation that's coming up, the way that we date is we get in relationships, we get out. And so you have to, you have to follow something else. And so Proverbs 4.23, it doesn't say follow your heart for it's the wellspring of life. It says guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. Everything you do flows from it. And so what it means to guard your heart is be careful what you feed it because our heart is like a bloodhound. It follows the scent of what we feed it. I'll meet with young ladies and they'll say, you know, I, I don't, I don't know why I keep dating, you know, these, these jerks and i'll say well what kind of music do you listen to and what's your favorite show 
And they're like, what does that have anything to do with it? And I was like, well, what you feed your heart has everything to do with what you're attracted to because you're informing your heart. You're telling it what to look for. And so I, I would not follow your heart. I would inform it. I would, I would tell it what to love. We would never follow a GPS before we put in a destination. Well, that's good. That's a good one. I'm going to yeah. write that GP. That was you can steal it. You can wow. put your name on it. When you're writing a book, you wrote a book. Ah. All right. This one. Can you really let go of worry and the need to control your life? Okay. So first of all, I'll admit that's just not for like a millennial because I have some control issues about controlling my life. And it's interesting, COVID-19 kind of blasted that out of the water because I can't control anything. And I'm yeah. one day at a time because as I go into budget season and I go into planning for, you know, seasons of work and, and shows, it's very difficult to plan. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So can you really though, JP, let go of worry and the need to control your life and how do you do that? Yeah, you probably can't do it quickly. And so let me just say, somebody who struggles with anxiety and worry, uh, I know that it, it, I don't want to just put a Band-Aid on somebody's problems. And there's different layers of this. And I know that some people need, you know, professional help. And, and, um, and when we talk about worry and anxiety, we're not all talking about the same. And the same thing with control. I mean, you've got like OCD on that spectrum. And then you just have the general like, okay, I really want to be in control. And like you say, our circumstance today can really challenge that. And so I don't want to present this idea like it's going to be easy. And that's what I think the generation that, that's listening to you, Melinda, really needs to hear is just because something's hard doesn't mean it's wrong. Like sometimes things are just difficult and they're right and they're hard and, and they're the right thing to do. And so as the scripture calls us to take our thoughts captive, that's not easy. That can be a battle. That can really be something that we have to work hard at every single day. And as we let go of control, I mean, it, it, it's a daily realization that we're not in control. I liken it to when pre-coronavirus, um, pre-COVID-19, and when it's not flu season, when I, my, my daughter was like three or four years old, I would go to the store and I would put her in these, you know, these shopping carts with like a steering wheel on them. Like they have like a car on the front and we would have this, we'd play this game where I would let her steer and I would be the engine and wherever she'd go, I'd take the cart. Like she goes right. I'd take us right. She goes left. I take us left and we're bumping into the apple, I, you know, the apple uh, stand and hitting the cereal off the shelf. Cause I'm committed to going wherever she goes. And she thinks she's in control. Like she literally, this is like going to the go-kart place for her. She, she's driving in the grocery store. Sooner or later, she steers right and I take us left. And I would watch this three-year-old grip that wheel tight and wonder what was wrong. And she'd steer right with all her might and I'd effortlessly take us left mm -hmm. because she wasn't in control. Her control was an illusion of my will. I was in control. And, and we can play the game and we can have fun, but ultimately I have an agenda, something I need to accomplish. I'm there, you know, with a grocery list and, and it's not, I'm not just there, you know, for her enjoyment. And so as, as sooner or later she steers right and I can say, no, nope, we got to go left. And so when she steers right and I take us right, she can rejoice, re she can have fun, she can celebrate. But when she steers right and I take us left, she has to trust. And this is the same with God. God is in control. That's, that's the reality. And so, I mean, we, we all, we could die today. We could get hit with a meteor. We could slip on some ice and, you know, all kinds of terrible things can happen. And we, he says, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. And so I think we have to take that to heart to just look at, at you know, just some practical advice to give your worry 24 hour boundary, just to look at today, say, hey, I'm literally not going to let my mind drift tomorrow. I'm going to stay with the problems in front of me. Uh, to to take intrusive thoughts captive, to be amused by them, to look at them, but ultimately turn them into prayer. And and then I would just say to move on to productive things in, in the midst of the anxieties that we feel. Yeah, no, it's good. Wow. You know, for young adults, and I think for a lot of a lot of us, but you know, when we're looking at millennials, just um, the struggle they're having, and what you've mentioned before, pornography and cutting, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, and depression, and we've, we've but I think it's important that, you know, we're looking at, you know, when I talk to millennial, you know, women across Canada and these deep struggles and you say that, you know, you can break free from them. You, you know, you've, you've worked hard at that and, and have done that, JP. And I think just to share the encouragement of that, because I know people who are watching and listening are like right in the, in the depths of this, of deep despair, struggle and addiction and wondering, will they ever be able to get out of it? Will people understand they're living with shame 
uh, judgment and yeah what's what's the hope that you can speak into that for them yeah when i think about addiction and and being entrapped you know i think about sin and Paul, when he writes in Romans 6, 7, and 8, he just talks about being dead in sin. And so, like, I, I picture myself when I'm, when I'm given to sin, I'm, I'm on a gurney, I'm dead. Like, my heart, my flat lines, you know, I need, I need CPR. And so, hold on to that to your, to your viewers. I would just say, hold on to that idea, CPR. And now let's go through it. So, the first thing you do is you confess. Uh, every single time you bring it to the light because because the enemy loves to play in the darkness and so when you think yeah, I can't tell anybody your, your struggles grow in the darkness so you bring it to the light and you say hey man I just I just looked at pornography I just gave myself to an image this is what I did and you ask people to pray for you this is what James 5 16 says confess your sins to to one another and pray for each other for the prayers of, of a righteous person are powerful and effective so, so confess. The second one, the P is pray. And so when I was in the depths and darkness of my pornography addiction, I would just pray these really honest, gritty prayers. Like God sees you. He knows everything. He's not scared. And I would just like cry for help in, in the most explicit ways that were so honest. And I would pray every day as though my life depended on it because it did. And that goes also goes with James five sixteen. And then the R is remove access. And so make it difficult for yourself to get like, like you delete your dealer's number, you know, you, you get rid of your internet or you um, put, put some accountability software and you get a roommate, you take your, your door off the hinges, whatever you need to do to make it difficult to remove access. And people will say, well, isn't that legalistic? Well, Jesus says in Matthew five, that if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Uh, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And so I, I do think he's speaking hyper, hyperbolically, but I also think he's making the point to do whatever it takes. And I'll have people come up with me, uh, you know, come up to talk to me and they'll say, you know, JP, my story is just like yours. I'm struggling with porn. And I'll say, well, how do you access porn? And they'll say my phone. And they'll say, I thought you said you were struggling. And they say, I am, I'm struggling. And I say, well, no, you're not. You're carrying it around with you everywhere you go. It's in your pocket. You haven't even begun to struggle. You haven't even started the fight. And they'll be like, well, what do you want me to do? Get rid of my phone? Well, in one word, yes. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. You know, or get a, get a brick phone or an old Motorola razor or something. You know, nobody's looking at porn on that. It's all grainy and stuff. I mean, you know, you, you, can, you can take steps. My point to them is just to say you can take steps to make this more difficult. And so, like I said, you're dead in your sins. You need CPR. Confess, pray, remove access. And, and then I would just say, you know, find a superior addiction, meaning, you know, find a greater joy in Jesus, begin to foster that relationship and affection in him. Yeah, no, I like that. I think, you know, I think for myself, when I was 16, like I attempted suicide and struggled with depression. And then if I, when I kind of look back at that CP, my focus was all on myself and, and yeah. what was wrong and all of that versus saying, you know, what has God for me? You know, what what is sort of this like plan for my life? And I mean, once I got it, it was like, it took off. Like I was like, well, I love telling stories. I love communicating. You know, I love to party and be a wooer from my strength finder. So and immediately, like, well, get people excited about something, a project. I started doing fundraising. All of a sudden, these things that were triggers of what I love to do were, were things that made sense in my career. So fundraising, marketing, PR, shows, media, broadcasting, which bring me all joy. But I was kind of putting all those things in more of like partying clubbing, you know, wooing people to the clubs and all that kind of thing. And God was like, whoa, those are things in you, but let me just sort of like change direction in, in that way. And now, I'm, you know, at, at this place where I'm really like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. And yeah. all the stuff I love, and yeah. I still dance parties, I still do all those things, but it's yeah. really kind of refocusing into sort of, yeah, I love that kind of like this, I wouldn't say like that, what you said, sort of like a, uh, superior addiction, but the, the stuff they love, but it's just really, you know, life-giving and God-pleasing, right? There's a guy that I actually talk about. I love that, Melinda. There's a guy that I talk about in the book. And uh, I, when I met him, you know, he was just like, hey, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus, but I can't stop smoking weed, you know? And, and he was just like, I want to hold on to this. And his job was, he would throw these, these 
epic rages, these, these parties, and he'd bring in these DJs, you know, and, and just everybody would come. And so he's this promoter and everybody knew him and everybody loved him. He's making a ton of money. And he was really good at throwing parties. And what God did is he brought him into the church. He committed his life to, to Jesus and to his body, the church. And he began to grow in his faith. And I just watched this young man say, well, I don't, what are my gifts? Like, I, I don't know what I have to offer. Like, I just throw parties. And I'm like, well, cool. We have, we have a spot for that. And we started this ministry around him after the porch. He would do this deal called Porch Late Night. And, you know, church parties are, are usually lame. But they weren't because, you know, he was throwing them and he was really good at it. And so we had these amazing parties after the porch that were kind of became renowned throughout the cities because he was using, you know, what the enemy meant for evil, God was using for good through him. And that's just what he does. He takes our mess and he makes it our message and even our ministry, you know, and that's why I was just, that's why it's so important for you to bring your junk into the light because God can use it. Like he will do good of it. He may write, write a book out of it. Hey, yeah. I'm still trying to work on my book, JP. So maybe it's just a little like, hope. Oh, you keep me posted. I, I can't wait to well. tell about it. Um, I love this for the last question. Actually, two last questions. Um, you have that there are some key mistakes that young adults make to really hinder success and impact. Um, I think that'd be really interesting for people. I'd like to hear that for myself too. But what, were the, what are some of the mistakes that, that young people are making? Yeah, we've touched on two of, of the big ones already. And so one is narcissism. Uh, that, like when we go through this world and thinking this world is about us, uh, like we're like on the Truman Show and we'll walk into a room and everybody's really talking about us. Like th this sets us up for disastrous disappointment. And, and so I think if we can realize that we play this cameo in this movie that is is all about someone else and we're on the scene for about five seconds uh, it, it's just really a healthy perspective in fact to become big we just sometimes have to become really 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 small and jesus says this in mark 10 he says whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant i really think that, that the kingdom of heaven is an upside down economy and and narcissism i don't think we understand how dangerous it is through the technology age social media all of this we're trying to become the star of our life and it's not good for us we weren't meant to be the, the weight of glory has to be offloaded onto the sturdy shelf of jesus like if you try to carry that on your shoulders it's going to crush you and so um so i think that would be one and then the other one we also touched on which is just you know you feed something and it grows and and so like you have to pay attention to what you pay attention to uh and so if you feed an addiction that addiction grows bigger and stronger. This is the lie to, to my young friends. This is the lie of the one last time you think, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to call her one last time, or I'm going to go there one last time, or I'm going to, uh, you know, please myself one last time. But what you did is, is you fed something and it grew so that the next time is going to be more difficult than the last time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, our choices have consequences and, I think that we can you know, just like love God and, and do the right thing it is if you do that, you, you will set yourself up for, uh, uh, you know, a greater life. I know that sounds a, a little bit trite, but it, it's true. Yeah, it's amazing. So welcome to adulting your hope for this book and, and like reading all these sort of accolades, JP, like it's a survival guide. This is a, a must go to book for anybody that's trying to navigate, you know, moving and jumping into adulthood. What, what's your hope for, you know, your message it through your words? Yeah. I, I always think about, you know, what is, what are, what are tiny decisions that we can make that would have a big impact? And so as I wrote this book, I think I'm not just, I'm not just trying to help someone in today. Like, I think like, man, if we can, if we can get this in our head and believe some of the truths in there, I believe that we will be better husbands, better wives, better fathers, better mothers. This is one day. I mean, not even, this is like long before you even have a prospect of, of a husband or wife. But if you begin to embrace these ideas, you'll date better. Uh, you'll be better set up to, to find a career calling, you know, work a job with purpose, understand why you're alive. And so I just talk about, you know, how people have missed it. And there's actually three books right now. And so one is Welcome to Adulting. There's also, there is a survival guide that goes with it. That's kind of a, a 42 day devotional. And then I just released uh, Welcoming the Future Church, which is, is for 
for leaders out there too that's pouring into the next generation because I really am hopeful about Gen Y and Gen Z. I, I really think that I want that God wants to use this generation for a great awakening, a revival, for them to do something bigger than themselves. And so my greatest hope would be that, that people would find something so much bigger than themselves to live for, that all of the sudden they would have this new purpose to, to live in this world for something greater than this world. And we would see, you know, a really a supernatural awakening happen. That would be the, the greatest, my greatest desire. Amazing. That's so inspiring. I think somebody who, you know, is mentoring young women and yeah. now see here love is about that. I think that really just encourages me that there's resources, but also for me just to keep doing the work, bringing, bringing young people into sort of this space and place to, to let them, you know, thrive and, that, you know, work out their giftings and passions in this. So I, I, I'm encouraged by that, JP. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I, I love, I love your message. I love what you're doing. I love the way you're pouring into the next generation. And so thanks for letting me just, you know, play along for a bit. Awesome. And thanks for your inspiring story. I love when I hear stories that kind of connect with mine or, or similar. Yeah. Uh, feel like you know what you're not alone in that that you i love that your mess can be your message and ministry that's amazing that's so encouraging amen friend love it <laughs>